Mortimer, Episode 7. Thank you for tuning in to Mortimer, a book written by M.W. Cedars and narrated by Michael Drew. The theme music was written and performed by Danny Torgerson. Mortimer is an entire novel that you may decide to read in print or digital form. Yet each episode of this audio podcast is broken up into a serial of sorts for your enjoyment. We hope you enjoy this duty-free audio presentation of Mortimer. I can't believe that this Mortimer cat somehow attracts all the dames. Since all the flappers are flying his way, oh, I decided to get involved and announce this week's episode. Mortimer's eyes shifted from left to right, his moustache twitching, a notebook and pencil in hand. He peered at the villainous degenerates that surrounded him in the group cell. There was a table to the left where one massive tattooed man sat chain-smoking and playing cards with an emaciated yet malicious-looking fella. Several gangs of miscreants hovered here and there about the cell. The entire space was filled with a low murmur that came from the prisoners, and it bounced off the walls, creating a nauseating din in Mortimer's mind. Thankfully, Mortimer was able to find solace in documenting the occurrences that had led him to his present circumstance. It brought a sense of order, democracy, and authenticity to his experience. He narrowed his eyes suspiciously at the unsavory character sitting several feet away from him on the small bench upon which Mortimer had perched his rather large frame. The man curled his lip at Mortimer's unashamed stare. "'Precisely,' Mortimer muttered to himself. He licked the tip of his pencil and began writing again. "'Diligence and democracy have thus been compromised. I am rendered in a position quite out of my element. The very essence of constancy, predictability, and equanimity in these parts of the country— which I have laid my confidence and comfort in, have been thrown into a tumultuous tornado of tyranny. Inflicted upon me first by an underling from the shipping community to which I despair being born into, and with vigor aspire to separate myself from. However, fortune was not my friend today, and quite abandoned any rationale while fortuity, a ferocious sister, swept in with the greatest of obscenity, leaving a trail of filth upon my once meticulous lapel. Upon defending my honour, I was manhandled quite robustly, and have now found myself ensconced in a prison of metal, grime, and sweat. Mortimer looked up again at the card players. The ginormous, ball tattooed player slapped down a handful of cards— Three of a kind, beat that, Hanson. There was a response from the observers as the bald man's emaciated opponent threw his head back in a gesture that confused Mortimer. He narrowed his eyes and saw that his initial impression was correct. The malicious man had three fives and two eights. Well, Barker, seems you won again, Hanson conceded. A full house is quite superior to three of a kind, Mortimer bellowed from his corner. The mathematical probability of being dealt one is approximately 0.1441%, with the formulaic structure being... (coughs) The muscled man appeared out of nowhere and grasped a hold of Mortimer's tongue. I'll pull out your tongue if you don't stop flapping it like a flag in a storm. (coughs) Mortimer protested. The man tugged a bit harder. Bodger, back off! A guard slammed his police baton into the metal bars of the cell. Ignoring him, Bodger pulled a bit more. (laughs) Cried Mortimer. Bodger! Finally, he released Mortimer's tongue. You stay out of my poker game, he growled, turned around and went back to his seat, where a new hand had already been dealt. Mortimer made a face. 
disgusting, for I do question if that hand has ever been sanitized. He looked down at his notepad and went back to his writing. I reflect upon the latter exchange as being quite contrite, for at the park it resulted in my authority as a captain being called into question, and so close to her bounty. Indeed, I do have the documentation necessary to elucidate the truth in my claim. For only a captain is permitted to wear the great and honourable captain's hat. However, ridicule upon chastisement rolled off the swollen tongue of the captain-like doppelganger, his being thusly reflecting the surly sea urchin of the black flag. Perhaps he was a pirate, haunting the boardwalk, waiting for the proper moment to arrest the majestic Esquire. Mortimer let out a massively loud gasp at the thought. His tongue flapped around in his mouth, tasting like salt, tobacco, and feces. He wrote on with more vigour. The Boat Bottle Fan Club will most assuredly stand up in my defence. I do believe the future of her mistress is in my hands alone. I will post-haste begin a correspondence to the editor, so as to solicit a defence be written in my honour. However, before Mortimer could write another sentence, his reverie was most unpleasantly interrupted, for the aforementioned din had now escalated into an agitating cacophony with the heavy-footed approach of the warden. He stopped at the metal bars of the large prison cell and looked upon his captives the way one might imagine a lion would before devouring its prey. Mortimer Iscariot! He tapped his legal pad with agitation into the palm of his free hand. This was felicity indeed. Finally, Mortimer shot up, it is with most earnest condescension that I bid adieu to you detainees who, I conjecture, exist for the sole purpose of vitiating the streets of our fair city. What did he say? A particularly churlish man stood up, his hands in fists. Sit down, the officer demanded of the man as Mortimer haughtily approached the gate. And you shut up, he said to Mortimer, and then he opened the door. Officer Orange has some questions for you. He led Mortimer down the hall toward a row of doors. Stopping outside one of them, he pushed the door open, revealing a stark white room. A single white table sat inside next to two dilapidated chairs and a one-way mirror. Upon one of the chairs sat a fairly young-looking officer. Though he was wearing a police uniform, his expression told his supervisor that he hadn't quite settled into the position yet. He also had sweat straight through the underarms of his jacket, and his hair was damp from anxiety from his very first real live inquisition. Not only was Mortimer Iscariot the one and only son of the famous Gerard Iscariot, but also his arrest had happened to correspond with the escape of his father's killer. Boy, was this rich. Orange looked at the behemoth in the doorway and swallowed hard. Mortimer Iscariot was wearing a tarnished suit and a captain's hat was perched atop his mass of thick and unfashionably long hair. He smoothed his own short-trimmed mop of unruly hair to the side. "'Have a seat,' he said, trying to sound tough. His superintendent pushed the prisoner into the room. "'You have ten minutes, Orange?' He shut the door. Silent, the man appeared to be surveying the room. "'Who was this fellow?' Orange wondered. He tugged on the button jacket about his neck. "'Have a seat,' he said again, extending his hand. But the prisoner looked out as though he had not heard him. "'Excuse me? Can you hear me?' Mortimer lifted his finger, and his moustache twitched. "'Then I said to the captain, "'Sir, I insist that you lay down your weapon, "'for a battle to the death will not deliver you any honour. "'But his scruples were with the forces unseen,' and he wielded his cane with a ferocity that made the earth cringe in shame. Excuse me? A vulgar instrument indeed, a weapon of great destruction, with the potential of killing hundreds. However, my frame is not feeble, and I can withstand blunt force of the greatest proportions. His cane is no match for my girth. Wait, 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 who, who did what with his cane? Orange picked up his pen and started writing vigorously as Mortimer ploughed on. The felicity of the day had a pox on it. 
with skies being clouded with the graphite smear of imperfection that, of course, demanded recompense. Orange wrote words quickly. Girth, graphite, smear, recompense. The more Mortimer spoke, the more confused and sweaty Orange became. I shall have to go to the market to purchase yet another pamphlet for my drawings, as my innocence has been compromised with verbal lashings from the miscreants of the harbour. The officer wiped the sweat from his brow, trying to keep up. The sergeant was going to wring his neck for this interview. Uh, did you assault Mr. Flint at the harbour? he interjected. Mortimer paused, giving Orange a little thrill. But when he went on, Orange's momentarily excitement died. Documentation is not far from my grasp, and only with a correspondence, of course, to be mailed by my nanny. Justice shall be served. Then Mortimer walked to the table and leaned on it with both hands. I shall require a stamp, sir. Orange leaned back, intimidated by Mortimer's large frame. What about the ice cream cone? Did you assault the police officer? Mortimer stood up again and looked at the ceiling as he spoke. The United States Postal Service shall have to expedite the letter, for the lean of the law is communist and mirroring the movement of the USSR. Orange wiped his damp hands down his damp slacks in an attempt to dry them. He tried direct questions, making conversation, compliments, but nothing he said rendered any sort of rationale or straight answer from the inmate. Soon the door opened and his sergeant stood there. "'Well, Mr. Escarrett, it seems you're free to go.' "'What?' Orange couldn't help himself, for nothing that had transpired during those ten minutes could have abdicated his interviewee from guilt. Mortimer looked up at the ceiling again. "'The cleanliness of this establishment is quite wanting. I shall recommend a good regimen of bleach mixed with melaleuca in order to clean away the eons of filth that have caked upon the interior of this room.' "'Thanks.' The sergeant said dryly, "'Your butler is waiting for you. Paperwork is signed.' Orange stood up. "'It was a pleasure to meet you,' he said, at a loss for words, for he felt like he'd been hit with a bolt of lightning. He half expected to see that his hair had been singed right off when he looked in the mirror later that evening. His manager shot him a look of irritation as he led the inmate out of the room. After they had left, Orange smacked himself in the head. "'Pleasure to meet you.' "'Pleasure to meet you!' He flopped back down at the table to review his notes. God willing, there was something of semblance in his transcription. Otherwise, he was going to have to start searching for new employment. "'Your secretary tells me you're giving speeches again!' Anderson leaned past John's doorway, a smug expression on his face. John scowled from his desk. He'd been working to play catch-up since that horrible meeting where the young pompous ass had made him look bad. He hated doing work, but he wasn't about to let some newbie take his place. Anderson was the third interruption that afternoon, and at this rate he was never going to get done. Mrs. Peach likes to run her mouth. Anderson walked into the room and helped himself to John's stupendous view. Do you ever get tired of this? he asked, gesturing to the city beyond. Can't say that I do. John turned in his chair to look in the direction Anderson had indicated. That, my dear man, is wealth. Millions of dollars roam those streets. One of the richest cities in the world. John nodded in agreement. He wished Anderson would get his point. But it's not money I'm after, John. And you know it. How? Oh? John feigned ignorance. It's the certificate I want. But we've gone over this. I don't know where he put it. Well, he had to have said something to you before he died. Anderson was referring to John's brother, Gerard Iscariot, the man who had created the Centennial shipping line. Now, I assure you, he never gave me the certificate. If he had, do you think I'd be sitting around taking shit from Wolfenstein? Anderson narrowed his eyes. I suppose not. I have another plan anyway, John said with a wave of his hand. We don't need the ownership certificate. We don't? Anderson was insatiably interested. Shut the door, will you? John nodded toward the door. Mrs. Peach's desk was on the other side, and she tended to be a busybody. Obediently, Anderson went to the doorway and closed the door. Why do you care about the company, anyway? You know the answer to that. Anderson sat in the chair opposite John's desk, 
I want Ellie. Unbelievable. Anderson's eyes grew hazy. You don't understand how she captivates me. Captivated, John corrected. She's different now. Love only grows fonder with age. Oh, I'll never forget her. Moment I laid eyes on her fifteen years ago. She was married to my brother, John reminded his friend. Elegance, poise. She's quite a bit older now. As am I. She's not how she was when you last saw her. It had been almost ten years since Anderson had spoken with Ellie, and over five since he'd even seen her. Admittedly, it had been almost as long since John himself had seen his sister-in-law, thanks to that pushy Elizabeth Montague Dixon. She'll always be enchanting to me. Anderson had stars in his eyes. When we get the company, you can run the show. I get close to Ellie. Well, why don't you just ask her out the normal way? John asked with irritation. Well, you know she's married into a particular stature of life. I can't expect her to smile upon being taken out of that. Ah, I suppose you can't. John lit a cigarette and slid his pile of paperwork away from him. He gave up. Tell me, what is your plan? Anderson had somehow snapped out of his daydream and was now quite focused on John, who stared at him with boredom from across the massive desk. I'll get Mortimer to sign over the company. John shrugged. He fingered the monographed pencil that was on top of his stack of papers. Oh, he'll never do that. Anderson was suddenly incredibly disappointed. But he hates the company. John spoke with more conviction than he felt. He'll sign. He hates being chained to a desk, but he loves the shipyard. He could run things from wherever he wants. He couldn't run the company if his life depended on it. Oh, I heard he was some sort of a super servant. John couldn't completely deny that statement. With certain things, his dear nephew had uncanny abilities. This was especially true when it pertained to mathematics, his memory, and drawing. But as far as John was concerned, when it came to social interaction, reason, or being a decent human being, Mortimer's skills were completely non-existent. He did not say any of this, but instead he shrugged. I almost got him to sign several weeks back. But the meddling butler hovered almost the entire time I was there. Good old Neville. He's still running the household. The nanny runs the household. The Jamaican woman. Anderson's smile returned. Quite uncustomary. Nothing about that household is customary, John grumbled. But if he signs and then the certificate shows up, that'll trump your little contract. Oh, the certificate's long gone. But if it's not... John sighed. He hated it when things got complicated, and this whole taking over the business bit was on the road to being more work than he preferred. I'll search the house, and if I find it, I'll forge a copy with my name, or I'll destroy it if I've already gotten Mortimer's autograph. Satisfied with John's plan, Anderson pressed his palms together and stared out of the window at the city behind John. What about Wolfenstein's demands for Mortimer to come to the meeting tomorrow so they could discuss transfer of ownership? Anderson reminded John. It's very likely they'll sign it off then. Seems to me your plan to get him to sign didn't work. John ignored Anderson's comment. Where are you keeping him anyway? I'd quite like to see him. He's not here now and he won't be here tomorrow. John puffed on his cigarette with a self-congratulatory grin. But Wolfenstein demanded it. Well, Wolfenstein is going to have to deal with the disappointment. Anderson leaned forward. You didn't tell Mortimer, did you? John did not answer, but puffed again. Anderson clapped his hands together. You brilliant bastard. We have to convince Wolfenstein that my nephew is by no means capable of running the company. But they could hire out. Anderson's voice was urgent. We really need that certificate. A document that shows that you're in line as per the request of Gerard will be indelible. It'll carry a hell of a lot more weight than a document Mortimer signs saying it's yours. If that certificate is truly gone and Mortimer signs my contract, it'll be good enough. But what if he doesn't? You said yourself he's already refused. That leaves us back at the beginning. Anderson's question hit a nerve with John. I'll have Ellie sign it, Anderson gasped. Ellie? 
Now she can sign for Mortimer. She's an Iscariot, and Mortimer is mentally unstable. Oh, don't bring dear Ellie into this. John narrowed his eyes across the desk. Sometimes you have to tell a little white lie to get what you want, Anderson. He leaned across the desk. Do you want this or not? Anderson swallowed. Yes. Good. Then here's the plan. This was not part of my job description. Mrs. Dixon paced back and forth across the back patio, where she and Mrs. Peabody were sharing a glass of afternoon lemonade. Mortimer had returned home earlier in the afternoon, without so much as an explanation about his arrest or the destruction of the dining-room table. Instead, upon crossing the precipice into the Iscariot Manor, he immediately announced that he had much to do in his study and was not to be disturbed until supper. "'Well-qualified nanny!' Huh. Mrs. Dixon's breath huffed from exertion. Her hands were bunched at her sides. "'Needed to assist in rearing a young squire. Affluent family, requiring someone with training in the social graces. Academic aptitude and willingness to relocate. That all sounds like a lovely description.' Mrs. Peabody watched her friend march the opposite direction down the path again. You're going to wear through the boards if you keep that up. Why don't you sit down and enjoy a nice glass of lemonade? But, oh no, there was one teensy-weensy little clause, Mrs. Dixon carried on as if she'd not heard her friend. You must stay on staff until the child is married. She turned now to Mrs. Peabody. Stay on staff until the child is married? Well, I dare say that that, that that is not likely in Mortimer's near future. I, I never should have left Jamaica. Mrs. Dixon let out an uncharacteristic shriek. I tried to introduce him to some lovely girls at the Albright party. What did he do? He fell into the punch bowl, collapsing the table. Mrs. Peabody remembered. Mrs. Dixon's face twisted into an unusual shape as the memory flashed across her mind. Mortimer bending at the waist, sniffing the punch, his moustache dangerously close to the pink-tinted liquid. Oh! And it was dear George who had been standing behind him. His cane had brushed up against Mortimer's posterior leg, causing the overactive oaf to squeal like a guinea pig before belly-flopping directly into the punch bowl. Yes, Mrs. Dixon muttered. She took a slow breath and allowed her focus to move away from that horrifying memory. But then a new one entered her mind quite immediately after. She glanced back at her friend. And then there was the Great Dean incident. Mrs. Peabody hid her smile with a sip of lemonade. Everybody knew that Mr. Bartholomew had bad breath, and no one dared to tell the tradesman that, at least not to his face. Well, no one except Mortimer. He called him a series of atrocious names, Mrs. Dixon felt defeated. Uh, yes, and as I recall hearing, his favourite one was Miss or Great Dane, and because of that, the young Miss Bartholomew is off the market. Well, what if the halitosis is inheritable? Mrs. Peabody was trying to be helpful. We don't want that in the family anyway. Oh, for Linda! Well... Never mind that, Mrs. Peabody tried to change the subject. What about the Longhorn girl? She seems quite interested. She's been by the house a half dozen times this season at least. Oh, don't even get me started on that one. Mrs. Dixon dragged her hands down her face. I could have died with embarrassment. Oh, I'm sure a little flatulence won't scare Lily Lou away, Mrs. Peabody smiled optimistically. She must know that men do that sometimes. It wasn't a little flatulence, Mrs. Dixon stopped pacing to catch her breath. Mortimer almost killed a child. Mrs. Peabody set her glass down as the image of it came to her mind. It surely wasn't that bad. George said he was going to have to fumigate the store. Well, you know, George, he's emotional. Someone said that it smelled like something had died. Exaggerations, Mrs. Peabody insisted. Please, Elizabeth, have a seat. I'm exhausted just watching you.
After a moment's hesitation, Mrs. Dixon obeyed and sat next to her friend on the porch swing. I was so sure that by age sixteen I'd have him married off. Mrs. Peabody put a reassuring hand on Mrs. Dixon's. There, there, I never expected things to turn out this way. Refereeing Mortimer, losing our master, the lady of the house falling ill, as it were, and if all that isn't enough, it has fallen upon my shoulders to ward off a criminal who is threatening to ruin us forever. Well, you have taken that responsibility upon yourself, you know. The Dixons do not take responsibility lightly. Mrs. Peabody nodded in understanding as Mrs. Dixon went on. My kids have written me so many letters begging me to return home. Well, you have lovely children. It must be hard to be away from them. Jules is in a doctorial program. Mrs. Dixon took a long drink from her glass of lemonade, feeling better having expressed herself. And Lindy has already been promoted twice since starting at her job. Why, wow, that's wonderful. And how's your dear mother? Misses me dreadfully, Mrs. Dixon said without hesitation. But she has a bevy of ladies she socializes with and is kept quite entertained. Oh, I'm sure the funds you send her are quite appreciated. Indeed, she's been having the time of her life, Mrs. Dixon sighed, her thoughts drifting back to her squire. Oh, Felinda, Martima's already twenty years old with no prospects. Whatever shall we do? Well, maybe he just needs a little push. Push? What do you mean? Well, maybe marriage hasn't occurred to him. Mrs. Peabody rearranged the lilies in the vase on the table resting to the side of her chair. You know, man, they get fixated on their little projects, making a way for themselves in business and enterprise. Well, it often takes a lady to persuade him into realizing that marriage is good for him. Interesting. Mrs. Dixon tapped her lip with her finger. Mortimer does have an uncommonly thick skull. Indeed, but he's a darling boy. Yes, yes, Mrs. Dixon said dismissively. She rose again, the wheels in her head turning. We need to provide him an experience that will open his eyes to the female gender. Like a coming out party. What do you mean? In London, we did it all the time. Encouraged by Mrs. Dixon's apparent interest, Mrs. Peabody went on. Well, when a young lady comes of age... Her parents throw her a party as a way of introducing her as an eligible female to society. Did they ever do those for men? I don't believe so. It doesn't matter. Mrs. Dixon's voice was excited. It's the perfect plan. Uh, what plan? We'll have a coming out party for Mortimer. Mrs. Peabody's expression changed as Mrs. Dixon's words registered. Why, that'll be wonderful! She clapped her hands happily. Yes, next week, Mrs. Dixon decided, we'll invite all the families with young single ladies and let them get the feel for what it would be like for them to be a lady of the Ascariot Manor. We'll polish the best china. You can cook up a masterpiece, five courses. It will be perfect. But what about the table? I'll have Neville take care of that. Mrs. Dixon flushed with annoyance. We just keep that little issue between us. If anyone asks, we are redecorating. Wonderful. I have some splendid ideas for colours in the foyer. No, 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 Mrs. Dixon finished the rest of her drink. We are not actually redecorating. She dusted off her perfectly pressed dress. Well, oh, 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 of course not, Mrs. Peabody stood and joined Mrs. Dixon. Just pretending. You just worry about planning the menu. I'll deal with the rest. Mrs. Dixon all but rubbed her palms together. If everything goes according to plan, we may have Mortimer married in a month's time, and I'll be free to go back to Jamaica. Learn more at www.mortimerbook.com Copyright 2022 M.W. Cedars Written by M.W. Cedars, the author pseudonym, audiobook performance by Michael Drew. Neither this author, nor affiliates, comrades, patriots, or associates are engaged in rendering professional or non-professional advice, services, recommendations, or any other suggestions of any kind to the individual reader.
This book is purely fiction, and all opinions and all likenesses of characters, industries, cities, or associations with any place or anyone you know are purely coincidental. Thank you for subscribing to Mortimer, a book written by M.W. Cedars and narrated by Michael Drew. The theme music was written and performed by Danny Torgerson. Be sure to download the next episode.